The story of Naomi and Ruth is probably one of the most famous Bible stories of the Old Testament, and you're probably pretty familiar with it. But I want to make sure that we give it adequate time so we can understand God's character and God's nature and look at it through the lens of Naomi and then also through the lens of Ruth. Stay tuned. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. The Hearing Jesus Podcast is so excited to partner with Compassion International. We believe in Compassion's mission to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. I've seen the impact myself through the letters and the updates that I've received as a sponsor. It's not just changing the lives of children, it's changing entire families, whole communities, always through the local church and always in Jesus' name. When you sponsor a child, you ensure access to quality education, medical checkups, healthy food, clean water, and most importantly, the love of Jesus, delivered through a church in their community because of a generous, caring sponsor like you. And you can speak life, love, and hope to your sponsored child through personal letters that you'll exchange. I hope you'll join me in sponsoring a child through Compassion today. All you have to do is pull out your phone, open up a text, and text hearing Jesus to 83393. You'll get back a text with a picture of a child who is waiting for a sponsor and a link to sponsor that child. You can also go to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to choose a boy or a girl to sponsor. When you sponsor a child, we will send you a copy of She Hears Learning to Listen to Jesus, my Bible study, as a token of our thanks for investing in the life of a child. Thank you for joining me and sponsoring a child through Compassion today. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, and today we're continuing our devotional reading on the women of the Old Testament with the story of Naomi, or Mara, as she is sometimes called. And the story of Naomi is from the book of Ruth. And if you would like to dive a little bit deeper, I just want to let you know that we have journaling prompts every day on our Patreon page to go along with each episode, as well as ad-free episodes and extra bonus content like the contemplative prayer that we did yesterday. And the reason why I choose journaling is it helps me get that information from the head into my heart. And I've heard from some of our Patreon family that they just really appreciate that aspect as well. So if you think that's something that would be a benefit to you, you can head to the link in our show notes and get more information. Again, that starts at just $5 a month. And so we're in the book of Ruth. And to be perfectly honest, we could unpack this and spend an entire series on it. We may even do that eventually. But today we're going to look at Naomi's story. And like I mentioned, she's sometimes called Mara. This book, it's from the book of Ruth. It's named after one of the main characters, Ruth, who is a young Moab woman. And she actually is the great grandmother of David, who is one of the ancestors of Jesus. So this is a pretty important story. This entire book, this family is really important. The only other biblical book that bears the name of a woman is the book of Esther. And so to me, that alone tells us that we need to stand up and take notice of what God is trying to reveal about his character and his nature in this book. And so this book was written during the time of the judges. Remember, there was no king in Israel at this time. It was a dark time of Israel's history. But this book is an opportunity to see God's hand of faithfulness in the midst of such darkness that gives us hope to understand that even in the midst of spiritual darkness that God can and does show himself to be faithful. And so the story takes place during a time of peace between Israel and the place called Moab. So I'm starting in Ruth chapter one. And now Naomi's story is peppered throughout the entire book of Ruth, but we're going to focus in on Ruth chapter one today. Starting at verse one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. 
Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth, and they had lived there about ten years. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until then for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So I just want to lay out the reminder that scripture was written for us, but it was not written to us. And so it was written to an ancient people group that understood things that we don't necessarily understand. So we're going to unpack some of that. But I also want to give you the reminder, and I say this almost every single episode, that we are looking for God's character and God's nature. We're not necessarily going to copy the way that Naomi behaves or even the way that Ruth behaves. Now, are there things that we can look to and admire and try to copy in our lives? Of course, there's going to be characteristics that are are helpful. But the goal is to emulate the character of God, the nature of God. He is always the hero in the story. So I want to talk for a minute about names. Names in the ancient world were often very closely aligned with the personality or the identity of a person, and their names would often be changed throughout the course of their lives to reflect something about them, and this is no exception. We can tell by Naomi's words that she's in a lot of pain. It's interesting because the name Naomi means my joy or my bliss. So She previously was known to be one sort of way, and then she changes her name to Mara to mean bitter, which reflects a new kind of way that her personality has taken on. And so what we can tell right off the bat is Naomi is in a place of deep sorrow and deep grief. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that in your own life, but try to imagine what she has just gone through. She has lost her husband and now she has lost her two sons, which is the most vulnerable place you can be as a woman in the ancient Near East. Many scholars believe that Naomi was married to Elimelech, who was actually a brother to Salmon, who was the prince of Judah, the guy who married Rahab. And if that was true, then at some point, Naomi and Elimelech and their two sons lived a very comfortable lifestyle. They were not poor Hebrews, but they were the elite. They were kind of the high society. They were rich. And so now if we think about that, in contrast with her current situation, she went from being the elite, very comfortable lifestyle to now no more husband, no more sons, the poorest of the poor. 
friends, I wanted to take a minute to share with you about one of our new partners, Five Lakes Coffee. For 20 years, Five Lakes has been helping people discover the magic of fresh roasted coffee. They craft roast in small batches, then ship direct so that you are getting the freshest and best tasting coffee. Five Lakes uses the highest quality specialty grade coffee beans from around the world. And let me tell you, we're kind of coffee snobs in my family and their coffee has converted even my daughter, who is a barista. As a family owned and family friendly company, I love their mission. As believers, our family loves supporting other Christian companies. And one of the things I absolutely love about this company is that they believe in loving their neighbors and they value being good stewards of what God has given them. My two favorites are the signature Five Lakes blend and Chris's blend. Because for Chris's blend, they donate $1 per bag to Forgotten Children's Ministry in Honduras. And guess what? As a podcast listener, you get an exclusive 20% off your first order when you use the code Hearing Jesus, head over to fivelakes.com and experience the joy of fresh roasted goodness today. Again, head to fivelakes.com and use code Hearing Jesus for 20% off your first order. My name's Preston Sprinkle, and I host the Theology in the Raw podcast. Theology in the Raw aims to help believers to think Christianly about theological and cultural issues by engaging in curious conversations with a diverse range of thoughtful people. I have conversations with a wide range of different guests who come from different perspectives, and no topic is off limits. Sexuality, abortion, politics, LGBTQ, warfare, violence, marijuana, immigration, you name it. If you have a theological or cultural issue that you have been wrestling with, with over 1,100 episodes, we've probably talked about it on Theology in the Raw. Along with conversations with various people, I also address questions sent in from my audience every month. And occasionally, I will talk about some of my latest research projects that I'm currently working on. Theology in the Raw is not for everyone. It is uncut, uncensored, and I don't give trigger warnings. So check out Theology in the Raw through your favorite podcast app. Widows were some of the most vulnerable people groups in that culture, and so many of them had to resort to prostitution just to be able to survive. And so this is the picture, the scene that we come upon when we find Naomi working her way back to her hometown. During this period of history, there was a huge famine in Israel, and it basically was a punishment that was a consequence for their behavior because they, the people of Israel were doing all sorts of chaos and craziness. And so Elimelech decided to move down to this other place called, called Moab because he heard that there was basically food there. And so thinking he was doing what was best for his family, he traveled from the land of Judah and he went to the highlands of Moab. And so uprooting from your home at that point would have been a real sacrifice for Naomi. And she loved the people of God and she was attached to the traditions of of the Hebrew race, but she was going to follow her husband. And so going to Moab, which was a foreign country, was honestly out of the will of God. Elimelech was out of God's will by not staying in Israel. And I understand why he did it. You know, I try to think about what it would look like if I you know, I'm suffering a famine here and I know that there's a nearby area where they have food and I have three kids, I, I, you know, would have probably been tempted to do the same thing. But the problem is, is they were going outside of God's will because the famine was a judgment upon the nation of Israel. And so what should have happened ideally is Elimelech should have repented, tried to help his fellow Hebrews get back to God and prayed for the removal of this punishment or this scourge or this famine, whatever you want to call it. And so there are a lot of people, a lot of scholars that would argue that Elimelech was wise in taking Naomi and her sons out of this famine-stricken area, but there's a whole other set of scholars that believe that he should have stayed put where he was. Now, you can make the decision on that based off of your own experience or you know, what you think about the text. But what I would say is that either way, 
there's going to be a little bit of punishment or discipline or consequence because if he had stayed in Israel, he was going to have to deal with the consequence upon the nation. And famine was one of those consequences in that time frame. But if he went to Moab, going outside of the house of God, there was also going to be consequence. Now for him, what we see the consequence is, you know, we don't really know for sure how he died, but he died and then his two sons died. And all that's left is the women. His family line is now gone, and this culture would have seen that as punishment, as consequence for him going outside of God's will. If he stayed inside of God's will, he would have trusted that God could have provided for him even in the midst of a famine, and he would have stayed put in Bethlehem. Because the other thing about Moab is they did not worship the Lord there. They had all sorts of false gods. And so he went right into this area of basically trusting the enemy for provision instead of trusting God for provision. So I think that's mistake number one. And so at this point, the women are now headed back to Bethlehem. It's only about 30 miles, but at that point, it would have taken a long time because they didn't have transportation like you and I do. They would have been walking on that journey. And it was a a place where they were coming to understand that they were humbled, at least Naomi was, humbled enough to realize that she needed to go back and to reconcile her relationship with the Lord. And I think what's interesting is it talks about Elimelech dying before the boys took wives. And what would have been typical in the Hebrew culture is the boys would have supported their mother but instead they took Moab wives, which they were not also supposed to marry outside of their Hebrew race. And so for them to take Moabite wives was almost a indication of where they had fallen to. Culturally, they were not still following the Hebrew ways. Now, we don't know if they worshiped Yahweh part of the time, some of the time, not at all. If they followed both sets of gods, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what happened there. But what we do know is in the land of Moab, they did not follow Yahweh. They followed Molech. And we learn all about Molech throughout the Old Testament, how terrible that, I mean, they sacrificed their children to the fire and all sorts of craziness. And so Orpah remains a follower of Molech. And she holds closely to the identity that she has as a Moabite. And then the difference we see is Ruth, who has become a follower of God and wants to stay aligned with God, the God of the Israelites, Naomi's God. So at this point, Naomi knows that she's going back to Bethlehem because she wants to go back into God's favor after living outside of his favor. And that was her native land. All of her friends and all of her relatives were there. And so she has decided to head back there because she heard that the Lord was providing for his people despite the famine in the land. So she has really gotten to this place where she has decided you know, I probably should have stayed put in the first place, but we're going to head back there now. And so that's the crossroads where they're at. So they're, they're setting out for Bethlehem and she's saying to the girls, go back home. This is going to be a hard trip, you know, go find husbands and I'm too old to give you new husbands. So this is where we should part ways. Also, she realized that when they got to where they were going, there was not going to be a lot of prospects for husbands for them because most of the people that had stayed in that location were going to continue to follow God and not take foreign wives. So part of it was out of concern for them that she was telling them to go back. And can you think of that? How much these three women have been through the trauma of losing their husbands and whatever else went on in that country, it was probably really difficult for them to make the decision to turn around and go back home. But Orpah decides to go back home and Ruth decides to stay with Naomi. Now, maybe at this point, Naomi had taught Ruth about Yahweh. Maybe her husband had taught Ruth about Yahweh. We don't really know, but we know that there's a difference in the decision that Ruth made versus the decision that Orpah made. And we see that play out over the next couple of chapters of the book of Ruth. And then we see this declaration of Ruth that speaks to her character. And at some point she has made the decision to follow God and she makes this oath to Naomi. And we see the beginning of what unfolds to be this beautiful relationship between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. And so they come back to Bethlehem and Naomi says that she has returned empty, meaning she went to Moab with plenty. And that probably meant financially, relationally, and now she has stepped into poverty. And so there's this description of how she starts to really lament the things that she's been through. And the changing of her name is an indication of how she feels about that entire situation. So we're going to continue to unpack the story of Naomi and Ruth tomorrow, but I just want 
to help you understand that this is not the end of Naomi's story. And as we kind of unpack that, we're going to revisit the story of Naomi through the story of Ruth. But for today, there's a couple of things that I think we need to meditate on. We see that Naomi was bitter at this point, but that was as a result of not trusting God. And yes, it was because of her grief and her sorrow, but those things happened because she did not trust God, because her and her husband made the decision to trust really the enemy over God. They put themselves in a situation where there was now a consequence. And so now as she's humbling herself and she's coming back to her hometown, she's realizing the mistakes that they made. They trusted in their selves and they trusted in the false gods of the world instead of trusting the God that had proven himself faithful over and over. I think we do that ourselves sometimes. I think sometimes there is a temptation to chase after the things of the world instead of the things of God. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're chasing a different job or maybe you're chasing a different circle of friends. You're chasing the things that the world has to offer instead of the things that God has proven himself faithful in. But I want to remind you that God math is different than people math. The God of provision can do more in a famine than the enemy can do in a feast. I want you to hold on to that because as we lean into the obedience that God is calling us to, it allows him to prove himself faithful. And truth be told, if if we think about historically what has happened throughout the Old Testament, when the Israelites had nothing to eat, God provided manna. When they had nothing to eat, God provided water from a rock. There is things that God can do that do not make sense in the physical. And what's that practically mean for us? For us, when we are serving God and we're being obedient to God, and God has maybe called us into staying at that lower paying job, but we're serving him in that lower paying job, he can do more with our salary than he could if we were being disobedient to him in a different job that he's not called us to and we're making twice as much. And inevitably what will happen is there's going to be more bills or something's going to break or, you know, whatever it is, because God math is different than people math. We have to remember that the obedience portion is the most important because I'm going to say it again, the God of provision can do more in a famine than the enemy can do in a feast. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the God of provision. And I just want to bring to light maybe some areas in our own lives that we've been disobedient to you, that we haven't followed through on the things you've called us to do because it looked like what the enemy was offering was safer or a better option or something that was going to be better for our families. But Lord, help us to lean in to your voice, to chase peace the peace that comes from being in right relationship with you. Lord, as we think about Naomi and where she ended up, this place of bitterness, God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in such a way that it helps us to understand in the scriptures how to trust you, that you are a God that is faithful despite the famine that's going on, despite the drought that's going on in our lives, that we can look to you and know that you are faithful. Lord, help us not to be tempted to lean into whatever the enemy is offering us, whatever the world is offering us. But God, help us to not just reconcile our own relationship with you, but to help others come into reconciliation as well. God, I thank you for your word. And I just pray that as we study Ruth tomorrow, you would continue to reveal yourself to us through this story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going.